Well, good evening, friends. Welcome to Friarside Chat. As always, I'm your deep fat friar, Pastor Andrew. Friends, as we celebrate Independence Day this weekend, I wanted to share with you the true story of a song that I'm sure we've all heard. It's the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem. But have we really paid attention to the story? Because when you know the story, the words mean so much more. The Star Spangled Banner came into existence during the War of 1812. Now, the War of 1812 was called many, by many people the Second War for Independence. It was a war where we were expressing grievance against England and Great Britain because they had made promises that they weren't keeping. Having been defeated soundly by an upstart nation, the British decided that they would not fall this time. And so by the time of 1814 in August, the British had marched all the way into Washington, D.C. They had run President Madison and his wife out of this capital. They had burned down the Capitol building and the White House, the symbols of American patriotism. And the Americas were in dire straits. Knowing that they weren't going to leave any fort unturned, the British headed towards Baltimore, the third most populous place in the Americas. They wanted to go there because there was a fort there by the name of Fort McHenry. Now, Fort McHenry was a vital part of the American defense. It was on a peninsula out on the edge of Baltimore, and it was a, a place where in order for a naval assault to take place, they would have to go through this fort. The man that was in charge of the fort, his name was Major George Armstead, he knew the importance of Fort McHenry. He knew it so well that he figured within the time that he was in charge of the fort, he would be attacked by the British. And so because Major George Armstead wanted the British to not get lost on their trek, he commissioned two flags to be made. He commissioned them by Mary Pickersgill, who was a widow woman who made flags for ships. The first one he wanted was the inclement weather flag. It would be 25 feet long and 17 feet wide, and he wanted that to be flown when it was raining or there was difficulty in weather. He also commissioned the garrison flag. Now this flag was huge. It was 42 feet long, 30 feet wide, and flew on a 90 foot tall flagpole. When asked why he wanted such large flags made, he said, I don't want the British to get lost if they come to see me. In September of 1814, the British had decided they would take Fort McHenry by ground. They fought and fought and fought, but the Americans repelled them time after time after time, until finally the British said, it's too costly a fight for us, and they retreated to the sea. Now at the time, the British Royal Navy was the greatest in the land, and so 16 naval warships of the greatest British army gathered in the harbor outside Fort McHenry. They decided that they would, through a barrage of rockets and cannons and explosions, they would destroy Fort McHenry, thus decimating the colonists there and recognizing the great power of Great Britain's navy. While the British were planning this, at the same time, there was a humanitarian effort that was going on. You see, as the British had marched from Washington, D.C. all the way to Baltimore, they were taking prominent citizens as people of war. They were, they were capturing them and using them as shields. They would put them on the British warships, and then the Americans would not want to bomb the ships. While they were doing that, one man in particular, his name was Dr. William Beans, was captured. Some of Dr. William Beans' friends convinced a young lawyer by the name of Francis Scott Key and a man by the name of John C. Skinner to try and negotiate his release. Well, Francis Scott Key and John Skinner rode out to the warship that was in the harbor outside Fort McHenry, and they met with the British there. In the midst of this meeting, they negotiated for Dr. Beans' release. They were so excited about it. They, they were celebrating when all of a sudden the co commander of the British ship came up and said, we're going to be attacking Fort McHenry. Because of that, by tomorrow night, it will be completely leveled. We are going to destroy it and destroy everyone in it. And then we'll release you, but it will be at that point that we will release you as British citizens, no longer as American colonists. 
Well, they, they knew that they were in trouble. They knew the might of the British Navy. They knew the power of it. And now they were being held as war prisoners on this British vessel. Over the next few days, September 12th, 1814, the British began the Reign of Terror, where they would put their ships far enough out that the American colonies could not launch attacks back at them, but the British, through a barrage of cannon fire and rockets and explosions, they, they attacked Fort McHenry. All that day, all that night, all of the next day, it was raining and they were flying the inclement weather flag over the fort and the men watched the flag to see if the fort had stood or if the fort had fallen. They went to bed and early the next morning they got up and the cannons were quiet. The ships were no longer launching the barrage of an attack that they had been for the past three days. The three men gathered there uh, along the edge of the railing, searching the, the, the horizon line as the, the dew and the mist lifted out of the way. Francis Scott Key had a, had a, teleglass, a, te a telescope glass, and he, he looked through that to see if he could see, and all of a sudden, he got his answer. It was in that moment that he pulled a letter from his pocket and began to quickly write down the things that he was feeling in that moment. It was a poem that began, O oh, say can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Not only had the fort stood through the night, through the greatest assault, naval assault that had taken place to that point in history, not only had it done that, but the inclement flat weather flag was no longer flying. In its place was a 42-foot-long, 30-foot-tall garrison flag of stars and stripes that was waving majestically on a 90-foot-tall pole declaring to, to the British Navy that the Americans would not be defeated. Francis Scott Key and his companions, they couldn't believe their eyes. For the next three months, they were kept as prisoners on a ship. As the British tried time and time again to take Fort McHenry, but they didn't, and three months later, a treaty was signed there at Fort McHenry by the same British that had attempted to destroy the fort. It was ending the war. That day, Francis Scott Key and his compatriots were released. And on his way back, he wrote some more of the verses, and he finally got back to a place where he was staying, and, and he finished out a poem that would talk about that night, a poem that would be solidified in history as our national anthem. It wasn't long before that poem was published and then quickly picked up and put to music, ironically, to a famous British tune, and it began to be sung. Military generals required it to be sung as the flag was raised and lowered every day. By 1931, on March the 3rd, President Hoover declared that that song would become the national anthem of the United States of America, the Star Spangled Banner. It's sung now and printed in hymnals across our nation. And I want to read to you the verses of that poem and put it in perspective of the story that we've just shared. Oh say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner still wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. On the shore dimly seen through the mists of the deep, where the foe's haughty host in the dread silent reposes, what is that which the breeze or the towering steep, as it fitfully blows, half conceals, half discloses? Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam, in full glory reflected, now shines on the stream. 
Tis the star-spangled banner, O oh, long may it wave, O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. O oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand, Between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land Praise the power that hath made and preserved our nation. Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just, And this be our motto, in God is our trust, And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Friends, this week, as you may hear that song, As we celebrate our independence and our freedom, Remember that that freedom was purchased at a great price. That freedom was offered to us by the sacrifice of patriots. Men and women who stood in the face of tyranny and said, When our cause is just, this be our motto, in God is our trust. Thanks so much for joining us this week here on Friarside Chat. As always, I'm your deep fat fryer, Pastor Andrew. We'll see you next time. <laughs>